very good evening and welcome to Unfiltered on SABC3 and SABC News Channel. I'm Chris Alda Lewis. Thanks for joining us. Now, it's a little over 20 days before the polls and as election campaigns move into overdrive, the country is witnessing an upsurge in violent service delivery protests. The country has seen weeks of violent protests and residents from areas such as Pennyville in Soweto, Cajiso on the West Rand and Gomorrah in Tswane, as well as Alexandra and Kailicha took to the streets to vent their frustration and make their demands known. Now, basic service delivery, such as electricity, water and sanitation, has been at the heart of the protests. But the common denominator in all of these has been persistent violence in some instances, destruction of property and even loss of life as police and rioters engage in running battles. Now, to unravel this a debate, we're joined by Angelo Fick, who is the director of research at the Oral Socioeconomic Research Institute, the ASIR. Uh, we also have uh, sociologist uh, Dr. Karen Ransiman, who is an associate professor at the Center for Social Change at the University of uh, Johannesburg. And part of her research as well also is done with some of the communities themselves at grassroots level. And uh, she also works with those communities as well. To you both, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, Dr. Ransiman, I want to start with you. If we're able to just bring up uh, that graphic of what we've already seen, um, in 2019, an upsurge in the service delivery protests. And um, it comes as no surprise, I guess, we in an election here. And this is the time that you have many communities seeing it as an ideal time to vent their frustrations. I think there's a lot we've got to unpick there. At the Centre for Social Change, one of the things we do is we run a protest database monitor. And looking at our data, which spans from 2005 up to the current day, we can test this idea that protests accelerate in the run-up to an election. Actually, what we've seen in the last few years is protests plateauing at a particularly high level compared to the previous period. Mm. So I think the way in which the media picks this up, and yeah. particularly the way in which media focuses on the violence in the protests, can be quite problematic. Yeah. Many of the protests are disruptive, not necessarily violent. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we have to be careful about this narrative of acceleration. Yeah. Uh, these protests have been going on for a long time. They're not bringing new issues to the table in many ways. But of course, the election does bring a new focus to them. Yeah. Uh, Angela, thanks for joining us this evening. If we look at uh, what we know uh, thus far is that you've got the Eastern Cape. Previously, you had Gauteng, according to statistics, leading in these service delivery protests. The Eastern Cape has now, by a small margin, taken over that. But if you look at these communities, the issues are the same. You've got communities who believe that the only way to get government to listen is through venting their frustrations on the streets. And I'll come to the issue, Dr. Ransomann, of violent protests, but they're increasingly becoming violent from, as we look at it from our lens. So here I think I want to pick up on something that Karen's indicated, which yeah. is we need to distinguish between the protests that are happening and the protests that get coverage and get yeah. onto the national agenda. Um, so for many communities, they've been protesting since 1994, yeah. right? So the ongoing protests in those communities are about issues that involved the failure of service delivery to those communities of all three tiers of government. Mm -hmm. It's not just national government, it's not just provincial government or municipal government. Mm -hmm. And often what we have to bear in mind is that political parties are also using some of these protests to get their own cachet out of it. So some of these are not manufactured, but they're certainly encouraged by political players who get involved and want to use them to score points in the public domain against what they see as political opponents. And I think it's a very, very crucial sort of arena that we have to get into when we talk about how it is a constitutional requirement of all three tiers of government to work together to mm -hmm. deliver services to all South African citizens. Yeah. And so this political football playing where we blame particular parties who happen to be in municipal governance for failures that are actually the duty of all three tiers of governments is something that I think speaks to what Njibulu and Debele talked about as the hangover from the 1980s of a certain relationship to government that we haven't allowed people to unlearn. I want to pick up on that because uh, in the issues pertaining to Alexandra, we saw a lot of that political footballing happening. You had the Democratic Alliance and the ANC basically blaming each other for the situation in Alexandra. Yes, the DA practically took over yesterday. There were existing problems that there were in Alexandra. And now 
Herman Mashaba is basically saying, I need to go with the ANC to go and address some of these issues because the ANC was there all along. The Democratic Alliance comes in. There are now issues relating to corruption, but it doesn't speak to the basic necessities. It throws away from the basic necessities that the pe people of Alexandra have been shouting about for the longest time. And there I think the people of Alexandra are not alone, that their yeah. communities have been indicating that they have had failures consistently and the only time they say politicians come is when they want prominence in the media in order to be seen to be doing something. Service failure does not happen three months before yeah. an election, just like service delivery does not happen three months before an election. Service delivery is an ongoing democratic requirement of government 24-7, 365, all the time. It is not something that you prioritize 90 days before you stand up in a poll. It is something that the Constitution requires of all three tiers of government. Mm -hmm. And this is where I think we need to start listening to the communities who are saying this is ongoing. Yeah. It isn't spectacular around an election. Yeah. It's an ongoing failure. Let's take a break for now. We'll, we'll continue with this discussion straight after this break. Let's take a, a break here on Unfiltered. We'll unpack more of these issues once we get back. Get the facts first. In 1994, I For South Africa, art was never a good thing. From a footballing point of view, there was never a separation. Get to the truth. There's still some serious issues in South Africa. But I think the government can try to make it harder to work. Um, the apartheid in South Africa, the only thing that's going to be more than the democracy. But you know See what it all really means. I still give South Africa a hit. We are somewhere in between. We're giving our democracy a grain for sure. We're very happy. Democracy Gauge, weekdays at 5.30 on SABC News, Channel 404. We were there at the birth of a new nation. We are here today as her democracy matures. An impartial and independent witness to history, SABC News, always there when South Africa decides. Hello again. Uh, thank you very much uh, for staying with us here on Unfiltered on SABC3 and SABC News Channel. The question we're asking you tonight is uh, regarding violence that we've seen during these uh, service delivery protests. Are these communities justified? Is there an alternative uh, to violent protests to spur politicians into action? Joining us, of course, this evening to continue this discussion is uh, Dr. Runce, Karen Runciman, who's an associate professor at the Center for Social Change at the University of Johannesburg, as well as Angelo Fick, who's the director of research at the Oral Socioeconomic Research Institute. Dr. Runciman, let me start with you. Uh, you raised quite a valid point about um, whether the majority of these service delivery protests are violent. But what we have seen through our lens again is that there's a general belief in these communities that if we don't destroy, if we don't burn tires, if we don't blockade roads, then politicians simply don't listen. No one will come to come and address our concerns. What sense are you getting about, you know, the reasons for communities to engage in such violence in order to get that on its own is quite problematic, don't you think? I think the violence, when it does occur, has to be understood within a context. Yeah. Violence doesn't happen in a vacuum. Normally, when there is violence in protest, it happens after a long process of failed engagement with local government. Yeah. So I'm talking here about memorandums, trying to meet councillors, uh, having peaceful marches, and finding that nothing happens. And often we're talking a process of years in which communities have embarked upon. Mm -hmm. We also have to look at the role of the police within the violence, because often it is painted as, as if only protesters engage with violence. Often violent actions are sparked by police intervention mm -hmm. into to protest. So I think we have to be very careful to unpack what all of this means and focusing on the violence often takes away from a crucial discussion around the key issues around the failures and the quality of post-apartheid uh, governance and democracy. Mm. 
Angela, from a political perspective, we've engaged with you on quite a number of these things. Will you have this political football once again? I mean, you've got the Democratic Alliance, for example, were calling out uh, for Mayor Herman Mashaba to come and address their concerns. But then you have the ANC president, uh, Cyril Rom, a blurring of the lines in what seemed to be his visit to Alexandra, for example, where ministers were introduced, for example, where you cannot even distinguish on whether this is an issue that the president is addressing as ANC president or president of the country. Give us a bit of insight into that because some of the challenges that these communities speak of is that uh, the taking advantage of this particular period in the run-up to the elections to score some of these political points as we head to the polls. So there's certainly an attempt to get the attention of politicians in a period in which those politicians are also courting media attention and voters' attention. And that's not unusual in South Africa. I mean, it's a global phenomenon. Yeah. When it's election season, communities want things from politicians, so they court them, and politicians court communities as voters. Mm -hmm. This idea that there is business that the mayor does and then there is separate business that the minister does is, I think, something that South Africans all have to unlearn. It is the requirement we have constitutional court judgments to this effect, reminding us that all three tiers of government have to cooperate. And so you cannot simply suggest that simply because party A is in power, party B in opposition is going to oppose any service delivery. But that's delivery. what's happening, though, Angelo, is that you have the Democratic Alliance who's saying we need, uh, uh, there's a particular minister who should be responsible for this, and Herman Mashaba basically saying, well, uh, uh, the ANC is the one that's responsible for this kind of... So, there are, political so there are functions yeah. that are specific to particular tiers of government. So, for example, municipal government is not responsible for education yeah. and education policy. But this does not mean that something like community safety, something like community infrastructure around issues of sewage, water waste management and that kind of infrastructure is not something that the city should have to work with provincial and national government with. Should there be failures, we have, again, constitutional court judgments holding all three tiers of government to account for not cooperating with one another. You cannot simply play party loyalty when you are a civil servant who has a constitutional duty. We've also had constitutional duty shown to us by civil servants who refuse to behave politically and indicated to their principles that actually this is what is required by the Constitution and the policy and legal framework, and this is how I will behave. So I think we need to be very careful about generalizing from what a party political officer says to what is actually the process. We must remind, whether we're journalists, whether we're citizens, whether we're researchers, remind those political party officers that they work in a constitutional framework. And while they are competing in some sort of elaborate football game to win this election, they remain functions of the Constitution and have a duty and a responsibility to all citizens of this country. Dr. Ronsonman, we look at an escalation in the number of protests from time to time, but um, the issues remain the same. Talk to us a bit about that and in some of this research, these communities that you're working with. We'll bring up a graphic as well just very shortly about some of the... Uh, it's almost in every single one of these communities where you go, the issues are simply the same and that politicians don't seem to be listening. Well, as you say, the issues do seem to be the same and that's why they have to be viewed in a much wider context yeah. and how South African society has been constituted in terms of, of the economy, politically, socially. Uh, so something like housing, for instance, which is often a common issue. Um, so this is an issue of unemployment. It's an issue of the fact that we've got workers that earn only 20 rand an hour. And how do you survive? Right. So we've got an economy in which most people are not being able to share in the productivity of that economy. Yeah. But also, most importantly, uh, what these goods represent. These goods are not just a house or a water. This is a cr crucial issue of about dignity and essentially about democracy. Our democracy was meant to make sure that everyone shared in these goods, in housing, in water, in quality education. And we're finding that that's not happening. And as Angelo says, a lot of this is to do with the way in which national, provincial and local government work in silos from one another, the way in which local uh, municipalities are, in most parts, completely under-resourced to be able to, develop or to deliver on the mandates that they have. So we've got a real crisis, and particularly in local municipalities, around their financing, which makes it very difficult difficult for them to be able to deliver.
an alternative to the way that we've seen these community doing things, Angelo? Obviously, you can understand the frustration. Uh, so many years into democracy, uh, that sharing that Dr. Ransomman speaks of is simply not there. There are those uh, communities that feel marginalized. They feel that nothing has happened since 1994. Is there an alternative to what we're seeing now, the, the venting of anger and the manner in which these communities are venting? So I go back to Njabulu Ndebele, who in yeah. his essays in Late Apartheid, Rediscovery of the Ordinary, alerts us to the necessity of transforming the South African polity in ways that allow people to unlearn the ways in which they behaved in relation to a totalitarian government, in relation to a democratic government. And this is one of the failures of the 25 years of freedom, that we haven't had proper civic education to allow people to use the mechanisms available to them more thoroughgoingly. And this I don't just mean that the people in poor communities are yeah. politically literate. I think the people in poor communities are politically very literate. They talk about years of agitating yeah. and being unable to do the things they do. The people in the middle class communities, have, we've walled ourselves off. We've created this inequality mm -hmm. and now we're surprised that the inequality cannot simply be suppressed. It's as if we've learned nothing from apartheid South Africa where the inequality also couldn't be suppressed for too long. So this idea that we have two South Africas, one in which things work in which yeah. people like me can hire lawyers, yeah. can go to court, can sue the municipality when we're cut off, and a space in which people have to rely on civil society organizations yeah. to fight their fight for them. Yeah. That's not a sustainable model for the Democratic Republic of South Africa. Yeah. We need a different vision, and that vision, I think, speaks to our first ideas in 1994 yeah. about what country we wanted to live in. We'll engage on that uh, shortly after this break. Let's take a short break here on uh, Unfilter. We'll continue our discussion when we get back. Stay with us. We were there at the birth of a new nation. We are here today as her democracy matures. An impartial and independent witness to history, SABC News, always there when South Africa decides. The SABC News mobile app is your one-stop digital portal to all the news you need. Stay connected with the latest in breaking news. Watch the SABC News channel along with clips and live streams of all the big news events. And listen to all the SABC News radio stations live, including podcasts and much more. Simply download the SABC News app to your Android or iOS device from either the Play Store or the App Store. SABC News. Independent. Impartial. Welcome back. Thank you very much uh, for staying with us. We're asking you tonight, are politicians to blame for the violent service delivery protests that we've seen in the country, in different parts of the country over the past few weeks? Tonight, we have a sociologist, of course, uh, Dr. Ransiman, who's joining us. She's an associate professor at the Center for Social Change at the University of Johannesburg, as well as Angelo Fick, as the director of research at the Orwell Socioeconomic Research Institute. Thanks for staying with us. I want to bring up a graphic, and I hope you'll be able to uh, look at this one as well, both of you. If we look at, for example, 2004 to 2009, we've had a total of about 2,086 protests. That's an alarming figure. But I want us to look at it in context, uh, uh, Dr. Ransimon. We tend to see, for example, what does indicate at this point Gauteng at the time, which had always been in the lead, and then several other provinces leading, uh, um, I think one of the Northern Cape, the Western Cape 280 is what we have, the total 2086. But what does that indicate about the democracy that Angelo speaks of or the South Africa that we want to see that clearly has not yet come to fruition? 
So when you look at the data, as we've done at the Centre for Social Change yeah. around protests, between 2004 and 2009, you do begin to see protests begin to increase. Yes. And then that accelerates further from 2009 onwards. So there's important things there about the economy. We've got the 2008 global financial crash, which has impacts in, in South Africa. We lose about a million jobs from 2008 to 2009. Yeah. But also what you are seeing is the failure of participatory governance. Mm -hmm. uh, as Angelo was saying, that we have people who are trying to engage in ward committees, they're trying to engage in their IDP, and these systems have collapsed or are co in the process of collapsing. Mm -hmm. They've become spaces in which uh, party politics dominate. Mm -hmm. As a community member, you can't actually get access to these spaces. But also there are problems in the way municipal governance has been designed in that it's a bit of a toy telephone. Yeah. You can be in your ward committee, yeah. but it doesn't, doesn't actually go anywhere. And that party politicking, Angelo, has a direct effect on service delivery and hence we see the picture that is being painted in South Africa at the moment. If we can bring up that graphic, of course, that shows us between 2004 and 2009 exactly how many service delivery protests. Uh, talk to us a bit about that. The party politicking as well as the impact it's now having on service delivery and the picture that is being painted of the country. So I think up until about 2014 in South Africa, the ANC was fairly you know, confident that it would govern, quote unquote, until Jesus returned. I think the 2016 municipal elections painted a slightly different picture and was a real shock. Let's not forget the faces of those ANC officials confronting the results in, you know, specific metros. The ANC did not lose that election at all. In fact, there are parties around the world who looked at those results and probably thought, if only we could. The map of South Africa is very green. It's also, I think, unfair to suggest that the ANC has only a record of failures. Yeah. Um, but what has happened since is that as these new torsions happened with opposition parties in the National Assembly suddenly becoming parties of government at local government level, the pattern that we've seen playing itself out in those provinces, KwaZulu-Natal in the 1990s and the Western Cape after 2008, um, of the tensions in party politics playing out in municipal governance or in local government yeah. really begin to play out far more problematically. In addition to this, we've also seen an acceleration of urbanization in South Africa. That means that there are more and more people gathering at the edges of cities because they're the spaces of opportunity, yeah. because that process was interrupted by, you know, influx control legislation in apartheid, which meant that suddenly you cannot simply have an economy of scale. Yeah. If you provided services in the city of Johannesburg in 1985, it's not simply scaling up to provide those services in 2005. You have a much more complicated formula that you have to follow, and the kinds of demands that people are making are often not the kinds of things that are being delivered, which is why people are unhappy. If you didn't want a library, valuable as a library is. I'm somebody who cannot imagine life without them. Yeah. But you needed a clinic and you're not getting it. Your target becomes, because it's a habit you learnt in apartheid South Africa, which is to destroy the infrastructure that government did provide. Those local native councils of late apartheid South Africa became the focus of community eye. And that's what Ndebele and Mampili Rampele in Lane Ghost to West talk about when they say habits learned in late apartheid have to be unlearned. We haven't taught people yeah. how to do that. And then where they have unlearned it, we have provided them with a system which, as Karen points out, really doesn't work. 2016, I guess, a case in point. Vwani, we saw schools burning. Uh, I think I'm going a bit too far. We saw books burning the other day. Uh, books that basically spoke, uh, uh, that had a particular, uh, what the ANC referred to as an agenda. Mm. So uh, how did we then get rid of that culture? It's a culture that has been there, but... I guess many then would uh, 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 chastise these communities. You need a clinic, you have a clinic, you burn the clinic. What then remains? I think where I would disagree with Angelo is that culture um, that brought about freedom and democracy in South Africa is absolutely central. And it is actually central to what people are demanding. People do not want to be delivered to. They want to play an active part in governance in South Africa. They w don't want to be told we are going to put a clinic here when actually you wanted something else. And that's where we're failing. We've not provided uh, adequate spaces in which people can participate in governance. And in the failure of that, people are finding their own ways in which to participate. Now, we can disagree whether people yeah. should or shouldn't uh, burn a library, but this is what's crucially at stake, that governance is not working. Angela? 
So again, to go back to something that Karen said earlier, we need to distinguish between violence and disruption. Mm. These people's lives are disrupted every day. The president discovered this when he took a train and sat on it for four hours. That happens to people every day. Yeah. Um, members of the Western Cape Democratic Alliance went to train stations and pretended to discover this for the first time as well. This goes back, you know, 25 years. So this idea that the lives of poor people should be disruptible, whereas our lives in the middle class should not, is a really unacceptable idea in a democracy. No one's life should be disrupted. But if some people's lives go smoothly while others are disrupted to create that smoothness, that is a real problem. And what I meant by Ndebele's idea around habits learnt in apartheid South Africa that should be unlearned in post-apartheid South Africa mm. is not the idea that you simply get what is given to you, mm. but that how you go about protesting against that and how you proceed to hold government to account is something that I think we haven't unlearned from late apartheid South Africa. And so this idea of protest as a last resort is certainly an absolutely essential validation of those communities. But there are also moments where people don't go through the process mm. because political parties are playing political football with communities' future mm. in order to win certain kinds of games. Mm. And that's where I think a distinction needs to be drawn between community protesting that may be disruptive and also the kinds of protests that are opportunistic and that are fueled by political party mm. interests that we must be wary of in South Africa of lumping in with other kinds of protests which have a certain kind of legitimacy and to which government must respond with a mat as a matter of urgency rather than as a matter of political convenience. Mm. And some of those accusations, in fact, were made uh, when we saw those protests flare up in Alexandra. Uh, are political leaders completely out of touch with what's happening. I want to refer as well to that train ride that uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa took. And it was, it's in the newspaper every day. In Cape Town, you had instances where people were burning trains because they were running late. Mm. If you looked at the, the number of hours that the president had spent on that train, and it came to him as a complete surprise. He went to Alexandra and then told the community, I can see people are building on the sidewalk are they completely out of touch with what the challenges are in these communities? I mean, I, I think this is all, it's, it's part of the game, right, of electoral mm. politics, is all of a sudden now you have politicians going into communities, opening fridges, sitting on trains mm. and discovering things for apparently the first mm. time. And the reality is, of course, they do know that the majority of our citizens uh, have to make long journeys to work and work for 20 rand an hour yeah. compared to what they are, they are earning, right? Mm. The problem is that this interest, right, and in the lives of working class people is not yeah. sustained past 8, 8th of May uh, this year. Yeah. And, and this is why it's very important for communities to organise to keep these issues on the table. Dr. Ronsman, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Angela, I would have loved to ask you another question, but unfortunately, we're running out of time. Thank you so much to you both for joining us. Angela Fick is the Director of Research at the Orwell Socioeconomic Research Institute, as well as Dr. Karen Ronsman, who is Associate Professor at the Centre for Social Change at the University of Johannesburg. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for the tweets, which I did not get to read out this evening, but thanks for engaging with us here on Unfiltered. You have a great week ahead. I'll see you again next week, Sunday. Cheers.